So I'm going to hand over to Catherine. Um, we're very pleased that Catherine has worked with the Susanna Wesley Foundation and is here today. Catherine's a counselling psychologist, an associate tutor um, in pastoral studies at Ridley Hall and many, many other things and has many involvements. Um, but I think actually Catherine is going to introduce herself and tell her own story. So I'll hand over to Catherine and leave her to do that. But with grateful thanks. Over to you, Catherine. Thank you, Sue, for that introduction. It is brilliant to be here and to introduce this resource that we have been able to develop and I hope it will be um, valuable for all of you. Um, I wanted to introduce myself but I wanted to introduce you to give you um, me myself in a way that gives you a little bit of background as to how we've ended up where we are. So I thought I would start with a picture of Broadstairs in Kent. It looks picture perfect, doesn't it? And we were living back here in 2011. And from the outside, you'd say we would had a bit of a picture perfect family life. I had met my husband at Trinity College Bristol where he was training to be a vicar. I had studied psychology and wanted to find out how to combine theology and psychology. So I had also gone to Bristol to study theology. Uh, and we'd got married three weeks after my husband had got ordained. And then 10 years down the line, uh, we'd been in ministry together. My husband had led churches. I'd been for six years on staff of those churches with him. We had two children. Picture perfect. But the reason that we're in Broadstairs was because all was not well. We, um, we had just both quit our jobs in the church and we were both utterly burnt out and as you know in the church houses come with jobs so no jobs no home we were living on the kindness of friends and what we could put in our car why have we done it because our experience of ministry had utterly exhausted us and burnt us out i remember feeling like an incredible failure ashamed, angry, embarrassed, blaming myself, blaming my husband, maybe he could have done a better job, feeling guilty, feeling exhausted, distant, cut off, overwhelmed and really distant from God. And then I had one of those amazing miracle moments. I was sat reading um, one of the few books that hadn't been put into storage and it certainly wasn't a Christian book uh, and I noticed a very interesting footnote at the bottom of a page and I do what I always do with interesting footnotes I google them so I went on to google and up popped um, a chapter of a book and as I read the book my mouth opened wide because I read everything that had just happened to us they introduced a case study about a church that was incredibly similar to the church we'd been in. It predicted exactly the way we'd be treated and that we would quit burnt out. It then predicted and explained why the same would happen to the subsequent vicar. And indeed, I did observe the church over, over the years that followed and exactly what had been predicted happened. It was as transformational to me as the day when I was 11 years old that I was given my first pair of glasses and could actually see what was going on in the world. It took away so much of the blame and the guilt and the helplessness. It didn't take away the pain and it took us quite a long time to heal. But it was transformational for us as we realized that this wasn't just our fault, something that we had to shoulder by ourselves. There was something bigger than us, something that we could understand and something that we could learn from and take forward in our ministry. But back then, I was quite annoyed. <laughs> Why had no one told us about this? In a sense, we, had, we thought we had the map. We'd both been had theological training. 
We've been practically practicing in ministry. My husband had a long history of practical ministry well before he met me. And we thought we had the map of how to do this. But it was like someone had failed to mark the chasm in the ground and we'd fallen straight into it. No one had mentioned the importance of our understanding that church is really a big, messy group of people. We'd been taught about how to lead a Bible study. We'd been taught about rites of passage, prayer, communion, all of these important things. But we had not been taught about managing and understanding and dealing with the tumultuous dynamic of a church family. This was the book that popped up on my Google search. Generation to Generation, Family Process in Church and Synagogue by Edwin Friedman. He was one of the first individuals to take something called Bowen Systems Theory and apply it to the church. And Murray Bowen, who developed Bowen Systems Thinking, was a first generational family therapist. And he was interested in the way our relational connections have a fundamental impact on our thinking, our behavior and our health. And Friedman, who was a rabbi and family therapist, realized that the work he was doing with his families translated directly into the life of the church family. Churches acted like big families. And the step into well-being is to understand how our behaviors in relationships not only affect the functioning and flourishing and well-being of the church community, but also the well-being of those in ministry. And to be honest, I became a bit of an evangelist. Everybody needs to know this. <laughs> and fast forward 10 years, this has become the theme of my professional life and the lens through which I engage. First of all, I'm a counselling psychologist. I work, I have a private practice here where I live, and I also work at a clinic in Harley Street. And my specialism is burnout and work-related stress and anxiety. And I work with lawyers and bankers, and I work with clergy, helping them transform the relational dynamics that have found them struggling in their well-being. I also work as a coach. I was really fortunate that in my doctorate training, I could choose my research. So I ran coaching groups for clergy in Church of England clergy in three dioceses across the UK and in, investigated the impact of well-being on those clergy and taking that forward then I now work individually with clergy around issues of burnout, leadership, managing change and of course we're very excited that this resource is going to launch some new coaching groups which I'll tell you a bit more about later on. And thirdly I'm an educator. So I work as an associate tutor in pastoral studies at Ridley Hall, Cambridge. I run the relationship and emotional management in ministry um, course, which is great because I get to talk to both those training for ministry and also those training for ordained ministry and those training for lay ministry. And I love it. And I'm as passionate now today, 10 years down the line, as I was at the start, because I can see what it's like how transformational it is for people when they get those glasses. I find it hard to believe that working together with Susanna Wesley Foundation, we started working together almost five years ago. Um, by a wonderful a coincidence, I was doing my doctorate at Roehampton, which is where SWF is based. And so Sue was able to come to one of my talks that I gave about my research and she got the glasses and we had some fantastic conversations about what this look, might look like in the Methodist context. And I always have to put my hand up and apologize that I still talk in a very Church of England framework. And I do apologize when I get the wrong terms and say the wrong things. So bear with me. Um, 
But as, and what was amazing was SWF have supported me to take my research beyond that little niche that you get to do in a doctorate and start to draw in different psychological approaches. So not only thinking about Bowen systems, but some of the other approaches from occupational, organizational, system psychology and counseling psychology, my specialism, to really think about how to support well-being in clergy. And the great thing about working with Sue is that she does not want these kind of resources to sit in our inboxes or on our bookshelves. She is passionate about creating resources that make a difference. And so that's why the coaching groups that we're going to start running after this are so important because we're all good at reading, but it takes often a bit more of a step to put thinking into practice. So another resource on flourishing. I bet some of you, when you got the email, were like, yeah, really? I've read the book, I've done the course, I've got the t-shirt. But the reality is there is still a gap between the provision of resources for ministers and the impact of those resources. That it's not predictable this link between resources and impact. Not only do clergy continue to experience really high levels of stress and burnout, but the research is really confused. Why are we developing all these great resources but not seeing the output we want? I think we all know it on an individual level as well. So often we know what to do. Sometimes we're really good at telling other people what to do, but we don't do it. We know all the advice, but changing our behaviours is something different. And instead, what happens is our guilt can increase and our exhaustion can build up. And the reality is, is that until we see the big picture, we're going to hit sabotage time and time again. We're going to sabotage ourselves and the relationships around us are going to unwittingly sabotage us. Missing the full picture was the same mistake foresters have made for years. And you will start to understand the theme of trees <laughs> that is throughout this resource. For years, foresters have not been able to see the wood for the trees. They have treated trees as individuals. Thinking that to help them flourish at an individual let they needed to tackle them at an individual level. Perhaps they would thin the trees out, remove dead trees, or apply fertilizer very specifically. But they didn't really understand why their very sensible interventions did not produce the flourishing that they anticipated. And it's only in the last 20 years that research has identified the incredible related interconnectedness of the system of the forest that trees do not grow in isolation. In beech forests, the younger saplings are deliberately raised in crowded, dense environments because that slows their growth down and increases the strength of their trunks. So when they finally reach maturity, they are far more able to survive storms, and intense env env environmental conditions, and therefore they can support the well being of the whole forest. But it's not just what we see in terms of the trees in a, the overground, it's also what's going on under the surface, underground. And what research has found is there is a constant, complex, constantly communicating network of roots under the surface that form a dynamic forest system where nutrients, chemicals and hormones are shared between trees. And it works at a community level and at an individual level. At a community level, mother trees share their nutrients with their offspring. They can deliberately target which ones are their particular offspring and they'll send nutrients out to them or stumps of hub trees are kept alive for years after the rest of the tree has died because they have such a key role in the network of forest roots. 
And at an individual level, when you look at reforestation programs, programs, pot grown trees who are then planted into the soil never communicate as well or thrive as well as trees that were self-sown. The process of planting them cuts off the, the tender ends of their roots and they can never recover. So understanding the overground community and the underground dynamic interconnected root network transforms our engagement with forests. And it's become increasingly important with climate change pressures. That forests need the right underground environment to survive the turbulence of climate change. And we are like trees growing in a forest. Our well being is co created by this dynamic interconnection between ourselves and the community we live in, whether that's our family, our church, or our denomination, or our society. If we don't see the overground wood, then we hit serious setbacks. I was speaking to someone recently who said, well, it's all very well, I'm being encouraged to go on a retreat, but there's no funding available for me. The church leadership are reluctant to give me my time off, and I have no model of good practice from senior leaders. So without her well-being being held within this group environment, she's gonna to struggle to get off the ground. But we also need to see underground. If we don't, our flourishing attempts are likely to get sabotaged. Because just like the forests, the most powerful elements of our interactions are, are under the surface, emotionally led dynamics and interactions with others. And they happen again, like the forest at an individual and a group level. At an individual level, we might have something like being other focused. In ministry, being other focused feels like a key part of the job description. That's why we're here. We're here to care for other people. And I put myself in this bracket, you know, my, my work as a therapist is exactly the same. We're called to, to be there for other people. But actually that can be the very thing that trips us up when it comes to flourishing. Because what happens is we're not very good at knowing what we actually need to look after ourselves. And as the pressure increases, the funny thing about these kind of dynamics is that they become more extreme. So if our tendency is to focus on other people and their needs, when our pressure, pressure rises and we're getting more and more exhausted and overworked, we actually tend to focus more and more on other people. So just at that moment where we need to be saying, oh, what do I need to do? What, what time off do I need to take? How do I need to, to tune back into God? we're much more likely to be thinking, what do I need to do for somebody else? And risk our well-being even more. But these underground elements also operate at a group level. And one key factor that we think about the resource is an idea of fusion, an underground pull to bring everybody into alignment and agreement with each other. And one really difficult story that I heard recently was a situation where a church did not understand how the group responds to stress. And it led to a inter terrible outcome for the vicar. So he had been running the church for 10 years, very settled, very established, calm ministry. And then his daughter became unwell. And because of that, needed to, he needed to step back from ministry understandably for a few months to make sure he could care for her and care for his family and care for himself and at an explicit we could say overground level everyone in the church agreed with that yes of course you need to take time off it's completely understandable but no one was listening to the underground communications and what happened was a couple of months down the line suddenly out from apparently nowhere, a group began to complain about the minister's competency. Nothing to do with him taking time off to look after his family and his daughter, his competency in a completely different area. 
and it gathered momentum. It became stronger. And the church leadership were concerned about it, and listened to it, and, and it, it grew and gathered momentum until it became such a force that this minister was asked to leave his post. No one understood what was going on under the surface. No one understood that a church and a minister have an, an unspoken agreement with each other. And this minister, in going off to look after his other family, left a gap in the church family. And that gap created vulnerability and insecurity. It left people not, not sure, not, not knowing what's going on. But there was nowhere to speak about that concern. And so it festered. And it became, it took on a life of its own, and it became this complaint. And because no one in the church understood that this was really a symptom of an unsettled church in the transition phase, they saw it as the problem and they addressed it as a problem to be solved rather than a symptom of something else. And therefore it grew and grew and became something it never needed to become. This is why it's so important that we understand what's going on under the surface. <clears throat> and these underground elements, like forests, become even more important and dominant during times of climate change. And we are in a dramatic period of cultural climate change. Even before COVID, we've had decades of huge social and cultural upheaval, and we all know the significant and painful impact that has had on the life of the church. And then of course, in COVID, that's been supercharged, making us ask huge questions about what church needs to look like going forward. And if we don't understand these underground interactions, then they take over our communication and our behaviours and flourishing becomes an uphill struggle. I see clergy at the front line of cultural climate change because ministers experience these underground dynamics most intently. Not only for you are relationships the very heart of your ministry, the whole way that you, you relate is through these interconnections, which means you are push and, pushed and pulled by these dynamics all the time. But also the church structure intensifies climate change. Our informal organisational structure feels great. We want to be a family more than we want to be a business. But unfortunately, that informal structure acts like a fire starter. When pressure and anxiety build, it increases rapidly because there's no clear structures to help contain it and manage it. And therefore, these emotionally led dynamics become dominant. So where do we go from here? Well, this resource is based on three core principles that I suggest help bridge this gap between resources and impact. The first two of them are a dialectic pair, opposites yet equally important. There's individuality on one side and togetherness on the other side. The individuality element is the intrinsic need we all have to be distinct from the other, to have a unique identity, values, beliefs and preferences. But alongside that, we all have an equal and opposite need to belong, that togetherness force, that we want to be accepted. We want to experience meaningful and reciprocal relationships with others. We want to be accepted as an individual in relationship with others. And we understand that from a, within flourishing as well. If I think about myself and my husband, we are what we need to, to thrive is completely different from each other. He's an extrovert. He likes to go down the pub, watch, watch Chelsea play football with, with lots of people around him. Whereas I would much prefer to choose a walk in a forest 
and a swing on a swing any day. So we are unique in what we choose and how we choose to, to thrive and what gives us energy. But we also want to belong. I want my unique individuality to be embraced and respected, to belong and to be appreciated, even if I look different. And so that balancing act is a bit like a seesaw. Trying to develop both elements within our lives, individuality and togetherness, but keeping them in balance. And there is a huge wealth of research that points to that being fundamental towards well-being. But there's a third element, emotional regulation, which is perhaps the most vital and most underemphasized element. It's our ability to manage our individual and our group emotional and behavioral reactivity under pressure. So as work demands increase, we want to remain connected with our emotions and how we feel, whether that's exhaustion, frustration or disappointment. We don't want to, but we don't want to be swept away with them and become reactive, maybe micromanaging others or disappearing completely off into the ether. We want to be connected to our emotions, but also remain in contact with our prefrontal cortex, thoughtfully connected to our overarching well-being principles, those that we've understood by developing our individuality and use them to guide our actions. So we have three elements, individuality, togetherness and emotional regulation. And Bowen, Murray Bowen, who I mentioned a few slides back, he put these together into a concept called differentiation. And the way I understand differentiation is a little bit like taking your seesaw to the Olympics. You might find it quite easy to balance when you're in your own room, but imagine suddenly finding yourself in the middle of a packed Olympic stadium. The stress rises, the difficulty balance is increasing, and that is differentiation. One's capacity to function as an individual while being part of a, of a group under increasing pressure. And what I've done here, quite a lot on these slides, but don't worry, we'll share them with you, is to help you see what it looks like to be differentiated at both a personal level and at a collective level, group differentiation, collective differentiation. And I'll let you read these in your own time because there's a lot on there. But what I want to take you through into is the outcomes. So as we develop these abilities, these develop in these three areas, at an individual level, we have greater physical, spiritual and psychological health, particularly reduced anxiety disorders. In the workplace, we see reduced stress and burnout, enhanced coping resources and conflict management and greater social resources but it also has a collective benefit. When we have a strong collective level of differentiation, our energy can be focused outwards towards the explicitly agreed strategic group goals. We have a positive relational climate where we can not only work together, but we can work with other groups collaboratively. Our resistance to pressures, both internal and external increases, and we have a higher level of work engagement and staff morale. So this resource unpacks these principles in our personal and in our collective life. And you can see that we have six beautiful leaves, just as we have six chapters, two on individuality, two on togetherness and two on emotional regulation. And the first one of each focuses on the individual element and the second one, collaboration, connection and commitment is on the group element. And each chapter explains the overground, the kind of explicit goals, so you know where you're headed, the kind of best practice. And we draw on understandings from Bowen Systems, but also from other areas within counselling psychology and occupational and organisational psychology. And after we've set out best practice, we then explore what sabotages us, what's going on underground, and how best practice gets stalled. And then at the end of each chapter, we invite you to apply it to yourself and to your church community, 
through observation, evaluation, and interruption. So observation is observe, beginning to observe your overground and your underground patterns. Evaluation is considering their usefulness and their appropriateness. And then the interruption is the encouragement for you to move, to interrupt your automatic and habitual practices that are working against your flourishing goals. So what I've tried to give you is a very succinct summary of each chapter um, in these slides. And what you've got is you've got the overground, which is this idea about kind of best practice, know where you're headed. Then the underground, what goes and sabotages you. And then at the bottom of each page, you've got a, one of the thinking points that we've got at the end of each chapter, just so that you can see what kind of direction we're headed in. So the first chapter is unpacking the individuality element for us as an individual. Flourishing is developed through gaining clarity about our needs. So the overground perspective is I unpack the four fundamental well-being practices, uh, self-care, relational care, spiritual care and boundary care. And they are the four elements of ministerial well-being that have come out time and time again as the most important elements. So we unpack them, but then we look at how do we get stuck? And we unpack what it means to have a vocation of service and how the lack of boundary in the role means that often we can lose our self-identity within our role identity and the potential consequences of that. I mentioned that other focus earlier on when we are more attentive to other people's needs than being aware of our own and we unpack the impact of that. And then also I touch on the impact of us when we don't take responsibility for gaining clarity about our needs. And often, particularly if you're in a partnership, it can often be that the spouse or the partner can overfunction in those areas where we underfunction. We don't take responsibility. Sometimes someone else has to, but that has implications and they're not always good. And so just bringing that into the forefront so we start thinking really seriously about our role. And each chapter has a case study. <clears throat> and this one briefly is about Matt, who is exhausted from the ex what feels like excessive pastoral demands of ministry. And it just has that growing anxious pit in his stomach. And the work at this individual level is thinking about that other focus, that actually when he was growing up, his mother had depression. And that actually, as a child, it was incredibly important that he looked after her. It was necessary for him to suppress some of his own needs in order to take care of her. And he received lots of praise for doing so. His father was always, thank you for doing that. We really appreciate that. So very quickly, you start to stop thinking about yourself and start thinking about and then the challenge is then how to get back in touch with your own needs when you need to, when you've got to find that space because you're burning out. How to go about meeting those needs outside of the church. How to tolerate the pain of disappointing others. And how to realise that grumbles are not catastrophic. You can survive them and go through them. The next chapter is on collaboration. So this is the idea of individuality, but as a group. And you'll see each has a little quote. <clears throat> so every chapter I draw on, I have the book with me, Wal Wal Walburn's, I can never pronounce his surname, The Hidden Life of Trees. I learned a lot about trees when I was writing this. So every chapter starts with a little, um, a little bit about the life of trees. And I put a little quote there for you on each of them. Flourishing is developed through collaboration between church and minister. 
at an overground practical level, we think about all the systems of influence that ministers work within. And I particularly focus on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So for those of you who are not familiar with that, it's a triangle which starts at the bottom, starts at our most basic needs that we need to meet. Needs such as shelter, food, warmth. And until we have those needs met, we're not able to go on and meet our next needs. And they go up from our physiological to safety needs, both practical and emotional, to social needs, to esteem needs, and then self-actualization as the top. And I unpack that from a Christian perspective. But actually, in terms of thinking about collaboration, it's so important for the system the clergy live within to realize that clergy cannot flourish until those bottom needs are met. And we ended up being what the YMCA termed homeless for two years after that, that nice photo I showed you about Broadstairs. It was very difficult. And I remember getting our stuff out of storage after two years and seeing all of these cookery books and just thinking, I used to like cooking. I just forgotten everything that I'd enjoyed because at we'd got down to the most basic common denominators of where are we going to sleep, what are we going to eat, how are we going to look after our kids. So collaboration is about thinking about that. But then we touch what, what happens underground. And we talk about informal culture, the way things are done around here. Even the way we could talk about that Viking quote, even the way that had become so subsumed into their thinking that it wasn't didn't even meet the explicit level. It was just, well, of course, we're not going to work with that church. And I unpack it from the approach of St. John's letters in Revelation, where he addresses the angel of the church. And that angel is the personality of the whole church, that it becomes a gestalt, a whole and just like our body, the, the cells of our bodies change all the time, but we don't change form. And so what happens within our church's life, particularly churches that have been around for years, is that we've kind of created a homeostasis that becomes a nosification of this is the way we do things. And sometimes this is the way we do things is really not good for ministerial health. And so the, the case study that we unpack is an example of a church where the leader is just left burnt out, being off um, sick with stress. And there seems to be a high turnover of staff. And when we come in at an overground level, it's like, come and tell us how we can employ a better vicar. But actually what needs thinking about is the angel of the church. What is happening in the culture of the church that is burning out this vicar, burning out the staff, and will repeat itself again and again. And we look at the fact that just as in Revelation, some of the elements of the angel of the church were fundamental, real important reasons to why that church exists, and we don't want to lose them. But some elements have become habit, and they're time-bound, and they're not key fundamental reasons for the church existing and so to enhance flourishing for ministers and their communities sometimes we need to go back and take a good look at that it might be revisiting the angel its strengths and its weaknesses about thinking more explicitly about what do we really do not what do we say we do we might have the great policies in place but what is really expected naming the elephant in the room The third chapter takes us into the togetherness force from the individual perspective. Candor. I never know how to say that. Candor? Candor. Candor, I think it is. Flourishing is developed through an engaged dialogue. So at an overground level, I draw on what is quite, an, I guess, an organisational or occupational psychology idea, which is that of psychological safety. And I touch on Google's Project Aristotle where Google did this vast research project um, trying to find out of all the teams in their companies, how could you predict which were the most high performing ones? And to be honest, they couldn't find anything. 
They had hundreds of different variables and they weren't getting anywhere with it until very late on in the project, someone suggested psychological safety. And it became the only predictive factor for high performing teams. Now, I know that the idea of me comparing a church to a high performing team would be abhorrent to most of you. However, a psychological safety is not only linked with community well-being within churches, it's even linked with deeper spiritual growth and greater well-being in clergy. So we unpack the importance of this idea and then we unpack and pack what goes wrong with it because psychological safety is great when the pressure is low because really what it is is it measures our ability to balance the individuality and the togetherness forces that's really what it is but it doesn't take into account the stress bit the bit that third element of differentiation so I unpack then what happens then when we get acute or chronic stress coming into the mix I introduce this idea of fusion which is the extreme of the togetherness force and talk about the big happy church family, which is normally a big happy conflict avoidant church family. And how we seek to avoid difficult conversations, real engaged dialogue, because we're all trying to just be together rather than being distinct and belong. And for ministers then trying to develop their flourishing, we look at what is it about your personal fusion patterns? What is it about the patterns for belonging that you grew up with that make it difficult to have engaged dialogue, difficult conversations where people disagree, sitting with that and working it through? And how we co-create all our interactions. I'm very annoying for my clients when they come. And they really want to blame somebody else for causing all the problems and I always talk about the way we co-create all our encounters we bring something to it we're not just a victim and so in this case study we talk about John who's torn between his responsibilities as a father and to his church he wants to take a Saturday as his day off because he wants to go see his kids play sport but the church is used to their previous vicar always working on a Saturday and coming to all the activities that would happen then and they don't like the change and he is finding himself getting increasingly panicky and guilty feeling like he needs to compromise feeling like he needs to do both somehow so no one's really getting anything and actually the work there is unpacking what his personal fusion scripts are and how they're getting played out and for him it was don't upset your mother that in his family, difficult conversations were avoided and disagreements weren't directly addressed. And his role as the eldest son was to smooth everything over, smooth over misunderstandings and belonging, that togetherness force, means about putting other people's needs first, compromise rather than individuality and belonging. So his challenge is to work out once he's in contact with his clarity about, you know what, I really chose my Saturday day off for a really good reason. It's incredibly important to me as a father and for my family to hold that, but then to communicate that openly to those within the church. How to keep calm. And often that's what transforms a destructive conversation from a constructive one is our ability to keep calm in the middle of it and keep curious about the other person open and curious lower the temperature um, I have an example that my supervisor often talks to me about which is he once did some coaching work with um, a, a lead minister and his uh, trainee and the lead minister didn't understand why his trainee, who was far more controversial and wanted to create change far quicker than he did, why everybody loved his curate and thought that his ideas were brilliant, rather than the lead minister who just wanted a small change, but everyone resisted. And actually, what the curate did, he was uh, the trainee vicar, he was incredibly good at keeping in touch with everybody, staying curious, being open to different people's viewpoints, 
not being reactive, being calm, welcoming difference and embracing it. And that was the difference between the two. The third chapter, the fourth chapter is connection. So the togetherness end of things from a group perspective. Flourishing is developed through real and authentic relationships. So I unpack thinking about the, the incredible importance of social relationships and well-being. And then we unpack actually the key element of all the different array of roles social relationships play is about authenticity, about being able to be truly who we are with the other. And the, the boobers I thou versus I it is a really helpful way of seeing it. When we're able to be authentically ourselves with somebody else and they can be that with us versus when it becomes a bit of an object way of relating that people are something for us or we are something for them. But then we go underground and we look at the pain of crowded loneliness in ministry and the reality of relational stress. And we talk about how ministry is littered with transference invitations, invitations that members of our, our communities give us to play roles, whether that be the loving mother, the stern father. We're constantly invited into these transference invitations. And sometimes they're quite seductive. Sometimes we're invited to be the savior and we're adored and we're the perfect parent and we're the wonderful carer. But even with them, there's a great risk because the more we adopt scripted roles, the tighter who we are and more restrictive we find ourselves. The more we play a role we've been invited to play, the less we can be ourselves. And I unpack then how very quickly, particularly idealizing transference, can lead us to a place of boundary violation, where we find ourselves doing things that we never thought we'd do. And then we go on from that to talk about triangles, which is a key Boeing concept, which I find incredibly helpful for pastoral ministry, because we are com constantly being invited, we've been into triangles. People are sharing with us the problems they have with other people. But the challenge is when we accept unhealthy triangles, we end up taking the stress for the relationship challenge that doesn't actually belong to us. And because it belongs, doesn't belong to us, we can't fix it. Therefore, we're loaded up with more and more stress that we can never get rid of because we can't be the answer to the situation. And so we begin to think about how can we create relationships that are within within the ministry context, understanding the limitations of the types of relationships that we're able to build, and then beginning to think for flourishing about, okay, where can you build authentic relationships that will nurture you? And how can you manage these transparent, scripted, triangle relationships that you're invited into within ministry so that you don't get overburdened? And in the case study, we unpack the dynamic of a triangle that's happened between, and this is really Church of England speak, I apologise, between a training curate, so someone who's come in to train, their, their training vicar, and the church warden. So the person who's kind of, who's a lay minister, but with a, <clears throat> a lot of leadership responsibilities. <clears throat> and how quickly the curate can find themselves on side with the church warden and the church warden really has a, a few problems with the vicar but they're not having a direct conversation to each other so instead of talking directly the church warden is going via the curate and what's happening is the curate has ended up <clears throat> feeling overwhelmed and wanting to leave the parish the relationship completely broken down with the training minister and feeling burnt out and stressed and actually unpacking it from an understanding of triangles and transference to realize that there's another way of doing this, that without realizing it, you've been seduced into taking a role, how you can then start to create one to one relationships, how you can become less of an ideal individual. And I always find that with curates, everyone loves a curate. Everyone loved John when he was a curate. When you, try, you know, you don't get you're not at the top. And so you don't get the pressures. You're always the favored one. 
and actually just popping that bubble. And particularly, I mean, I've worked with a lot of people in challenging training relationships like that and how important it is to keep open communication there because it is the point of weakness where the church congregation can so easily break that relationship down. So that's connection, how we can really create healthy relationships as healthy as we can together. And then we move on into the third area, emotional regulation. And for the individual, I've called it calm. Flourishing is developed through a high quality regulatory response to stress. So I talk a little bit about the brain on stress and what happens to us. I mentioned the prefrontal cortex at the beginning. I talk a little bit about our amygdala, which is like our fire alarm and different bits that we need to keep all communicating together in order to keep calm. The window of tolerance, which is what our optimal zone of arousal where we can keep connected to our emotions, keep thoughtful and keep acting in a responsive way rather than a reactive way. I unpack the three stages of empathy and then talk about internal calm, which is where we calm ourselves, as well as engaged calm, which is where we offer that calm in relationship. And particularly when we're thinking systems, um, and Simon, you'll have come across this in terms of already the thinking Bowen, is actually how important, and, and Friedman calls it the non-anxious presence, although I like to call it the slightly less anxious presence, but when you in a position of responsibility are able to stay slightly less anxious, it runs out like a chain reaction. And your presence is calming for the entire community. So offering engaged calm has a, a positive impact far beyond yourself. And I talk about calm through the narrative of Jesus and Lazarus. But then we go underground and I introduce the idea of emotional contagion, how emotions are like hot potatoes that we throw to each other all the time. <clears throat> how so much of our stress is actually from other people. They generously passed it on to us. And because clergy and therapists are super sensors, we tend to be really good at picking up other people's pain and actually really tolerant of our own pain. And there's two risks there. One is that we pick up pain that doesn't even belong to us. That actually the, we need to leave that with the people who are going through it because part of maturing, and I'd say spiritual maturity, is actually learning to process what's going on for ourselves, ourselves, rather than asking somebody else to do the processing for us. So not only is our risk factor that we try and fix other people's problems, it's also that we ignore our own problems. And sometimes I think we've got enough of them to keep ourselves busy for our whole life. But actually, we need to connect with what's going on for ourselves and connect with that in order um, to thrive. And finally, I introduce the idea that as you go through this process and you get clarity on what you need to change and you have those candid conversations, actually when you start putting a change in process and the example I use is Tom who uh, who's off work with stress and needs to get to the gym how what he does is he finds himself constantly sabotaging himself and that gym kit that's just ready to be taken to the gym is mysteriously forgotten every day and actually when we start to change our patterns of behavior to try and look after ourselves it creates anxiety. It's uncomfortable. All change creates anxiety because it's new. But if we're not prepared for that, and when we feel uncomfortable, maybe if we haven't processed what's actually going on inside of us, then we will unwittingly sabotage ourselves and forget our gym kit. And in, in the case study I share, Tom, he... Um, Actually, it was linked to feeling incredibly guilty about taking time off for himself, that self-care was selfish. And until he processed those emotions linked to feeling like he was letting down his church team, letting down his family, until he processed them explicitly, he acted them out.
It's what we all do. So calm is finding a way to process things and act on thoughtful decisions that we've made through that process of clarity. And then the final chapter is commitment. Flourishing is developed through surviving the guaranteed group sabotage. This is the bit that's so annoying. Is that change is only ever established through sabotage. You have to survive sabotage in order to cement change. So I take you from the individual concept of calm and the individual brain on stress to introduce you to the group brain on stress. That as a group, we have a collective prefrontal cortex. We have a collective amygdala and we act out in predictable ways as groups. Like the angel of the church, we act as a group on stress. And so I begin to introduce a way of trying to approach these situations where, like the example I gave earlier, rather than having this group that's starting to criticise the minister, we get to see this as a symptom, not a problem. We step back and see the big picture. What are the big issues that we're not talking about that are being acted out? And then we unpack some of the group methods that are binding anxiety. So when I talk about binding anxiety, what happens in shorthand is that there's a problem, there's an issue. The issue creates a feeling of anxiety in the group. What then happens is we lose the focus of the problem. And we start just focusing on trying to get rid of the anxiety. I don't like the anxious feelings. I don't want to feel that way anymore. And we forget the problem that gets lost. And we just focus on how can we feel better? And often in the church environment, it's about how can we get a nice togetherness thoughts? How can we just come into agreement? How can we all agree with each other? Or perhaps how can we scapegoat somebody and get them out because they're the problem? And then the rest of us will all feel better together. So it's thinking about how we, the group methods we have of binding anxiety so that we don't get distracted by them. We notice them go, oh, what's really the problem here? What do we need to think about together? Because we're all trying to bind our anxiety at the moment. It's thinking process rather than concentrating on exactly what's being complained about or nitpicking about. And Friedman has a fantastic page of nitpicking that people in the congregation do when they're focusing on their clergy complaints. Rather than concentrating on all the different complaints that can come out, thinking, oh, that's an example of a group anxious reaction. What are we not talking about here? I introduce the idea of functional positions. And the example I often give is that there's always someone in the church who complains about the sound. And you just think, if that person wasn't there, I just wouldn't have to deal with all of these moanings and complaints about the sound and it would all be fine. And then suddenly the longed for day arrives and that person leaves. And you think, hooray, all problems with the sound are resolved. And then a few weeks later, someone who was completely normal beforehand suddenly starts complaining about the sound. And you just think, well, but what's just happened there? What's, what's changed? But it's a functional position. Within that church, we're functioning as a group where someone has been tasked unconsciously through no communication to hold the anxiety about the sound. The great thing about that is when we hand it to one person, no one else has to worry about it. Everyone else feels chilled out because that person is holding the pain. But when that person goes, there is an empty space and the anxiety starts to flood the system again. So we need to find somebody else. So someone else who's sensitive to it picks it up and says, I'll take that and drops into the position. And you can see it often in an organisation or a church where there is a difficult person on staff. So the youth workers are always difficult and then they leave and then the next youth worker becomes difficult. They're holding a position for the whole church. And so when we start to think about that, blame starts being taken away. 
because we realized it is not someone's individual fault. They are holding something for the whole community. What are they holding and how can we start to address that? And the case study looks at a situation where Deborah is a new minister, a new Methodist minister who's moved into the area to help a circuit action new initiatives. And through that, we think about the wonderful dynamic of dependency and saviour where we have a group, be it a church or a group of churches, who've entered dependency mode, which is a powerless mode, which says, I can't do anything. And then they find a saviour and they say, but you can come in and you can fix it for me. And you know what? It's quite seductive to be invited to be a saviour. Yeah, I want to do that. I want to fix it. I want to turn the church around. I want to get all these fantastic things happening. The problem is, is we're being invited into a mode where we are bound to fail and very likely to be thrown out. Because it is a way of binding anxiety that we can never be a saviour. Changing a church around or a circuit around requires everybody's involvement, everybody taking seriously what they contribute, how they could help, how they could think. It's not an individual act. And so we think about then about how she was able to, to start having conversations, but how sabotage was always going to happen. So the importance of having her um, superintendent on board to support her so that when the complaints start coming, then everyone's like, of course, it's going to come. You've still got my support. Keep going. Keep calm. Let's get through this. And of course, the reality so often happens is the things that people complain about, once the things have settled, then it becomes the new normal. And while you might have complaints about changing your day off and people think you can't possibly do that, when you survive the change and keep in contact and keep connected, the anxiety settles, the sabotage ceases and it becomes, well, that's when every vicar has their day off. Why would you do it any other way? So there are our six chapters in a very, very shortened format. Coaching groups, putting theory into practice. So I love a book. I have a bookshelf full of books, but I also know that learning this stuff, particularly when it comes towards sh making shifts in your behavior, trying to think differently about things, make adjustments, is difficult to do solo. So what we are going to start to run, and like I said, the first, at least one, if there's an, enough interest, we'll run two pilot groups, but the ones we're gonna run before the summer, um, are going, are, are our pilot groups around then, a coaching group model that we are going to, well, I'm going to continue to run. Um, to really help people as they read the resource to start to put it into practice. Uh, and like I've mentioned in these conversations with you guys, this is a developing area. So there's some ideas about what might be useful, but my, you know, one of my hearts um, and my passions is that I believe that every individual who works in ministry, ordained or lay, should know about this stuff. It changed my whole understanding of ministry and the whole way I work with people. And I feel like it's one of those things that it's really helpful just to know, oh, oh yeah, maybe I need to go and yeah, think about it from that perspective, a framework that we don't really meet in many places. In the US, it's, it's, it's very well accessible. Most ministerial training programs introduce it. There's lots of coaching courses like this who offer it. In this country, there's not a, a great breadth of, of, of options. So this is just trying to get it out there a little bit more. So these coaching groups, um, I've just posed some questions to help you think about whether they might be helpful for you in the setup that we're going to propose them to start with. So first of all, are you facing a problem or challenge in the area of well-being and flourishing in ministry? So you might feel exhausted, under stress, close to burnout. Perhaps you can't get the balance between work and family life. 
Maybe you just feel out of sorts that you're just not the person that you used to be or the minister that you used to be. Maybe even there seems to be mixed messages between what you're trying to do and what the, ch the church expects. Those kind of questions that you would appreciate a space to think about them in more detail and then to find ways to move forward. Second question, do you feel almost ready to take practical steps to address it? I thought it was important to put almost in because I don't think any of us ever feel completely ready to take steps. But perhaps you know there's a problem and you don't know where to start. Perhaps you've tried to change it before and you haven't managed to make the changes stick, but you're aware that you don't want things to stay as they are. The resource engages our thinking brain. So it's about putting that thinking then into practice. Third thing, are you pretty open to thinking about yourself, the patterns in your own behaviours and the changes you could make? Like I joked about earlier, it is often so much easier to point the finger and say, that person needs to change, this is the problem. And actually, do you know what? Sometimes it's a good place to start because we start to notice the interactions, but we're the ones in the coaching group. And so actually the change that we can make is the change in us. And so one of the things that is important is that you feel like you're ready to think about yourself and what changes you might be prepared to make even if we have to go through a journey about thinking about other people and dynamics too. And fourthly, would you like the benefit of a supportive and understanding peer group experience? So the benefit of this, which is in contrast to a team coaching model, um, which might be something that then gets developed in, um, to, alongside, which is different. This is a group. And so you'll have people in the group that are peers, but you won't know them most likely, but you certainly won't be working alongside them. You'll be facing similar challenges in similar situations. And so this kind of work suits people who are comfortable sharing and reflecting on their experiences in a group setting. So sometimes I have people who want individual coaching. Sometimes it's because it's, it's, they're really stuck and they need a bit of more personal work or perhaps they're just not that comfortable being in a group, whereas this is a group setting. And I love a group setting because actually I think we learn so much through thinking together. We just see things that we don't, um, other people spot things that we don't see. Other people have insights about their own lives and thinking, and actually we learn more about ourselves because of that. So if it feels like you tick those boxes, then, coaching groups are right for you and I would be delighted if you wanted to to join and sign up how I think you'll benefit obviously the resource starts the process of self-reflection and community reflection by asking questions but the hope is that these coaching groups make it real so first of all, that you'll engage deeply with the resource. Um, the approach we're gonna take is a bit of asymmetrical learning while recognizing that you've all got too much in your plates anyway. So I'm not gonna, not gonna overwhelm you, but invite you to read a chapter before we meet. So you've done the thinking and there'll be a little bit of a personal reflection as well, maybe a small task that you might do that then we bring together and that means that when we're together, we can really delve deeply, we can explore, we can apply it, we can answer questions that we have. So it's live. The second element is practical moving forward. So I'm going to invite you and actually we'll have what I'm going to do is with every member who joins, I'm going to have an individual conversation with each of you first of all so to start that process of thinking what are your goals how do you want to move forward and so they start getting really clear and then in between the sessions there'll be reflection a little bit of activity certainly maybe taking from the learning and applying it so that every session builds on the next so there's a sense of momentum and growth and moving forward 
you'll have, like I've already mentioned, that opportunity to have a confidential and supportive peer group where you can get real about issues and be supported by others, where you don't have to be in role, but you can feel a little bit more yourself. And fourthly, you get expert input, which is apparently me. <laughs> so this isn't a pre-written course. I would work with you guys as I would an individual client. So the opportunity there for us to really analyze the situation, to troubleshoot, like I'm talking about tools, my thinking is that these these pilot groups will help me. I'll be developing tools as we go along. When I see actually that's not explained very well or you're not really understanding that, then the intention is that then I'll be developing resources then that will build um, and I'll share like I do with all my clients. If I think, oh, that might be useful, then I'll send something over or share something. So it'll be interactive um, and engaged. The practicalities. So first conversation with me just to have a chat um get things kind of start to think together gives me a little bit of background on, on you as well uh, so i start to understand a little bit of where you're coming from um, the groups will have up to eight participants so if there's enough enough interest we'll run two um, the sessions are going to be six sessions fortnightly from may so one of each of the chapters and they'll either be in the morning or the evening. And I will, if, you, if you're interested, email me and then I'll send you out something that will just ask to let me know which would you prefer? Could you do both? Could you do one or the other? And then I'll choose, if we're only running one group, then I'll choose the one that most people can make. The group will be two hours and there will be a little bit of time that I'll invite you to do beforehand, reading that chapter and doing some reflection and some practical work yourself, but not onerous. And the cost is £300 per person. So that breaks down at £50 for a two hour session, which, you know, a bargain. <laughs> so, um, and all I would ask then, they are pilot groups. So, one of the things that I will really um, value from you is feedback. So, what works, what doesn't work, how we can improve it. So, being realistic about the fact this is a learning process for me as well as for you. So if you are interested, that is my email address. Please do email me. In the last session, someone asks, can I share this with other people if I think other people might be interested? Please do. 